Welcome to Castle Rock Radio. This is Dan and Chris on Ed Nation. Chris, welcome. You had a little challenging day today driving around, didn't you? <laughs> I've been moving a bit. It's that time of the year. It really is that time of the year. We have a ton of updates today to talk about with the school year wrapping up here very rapidly. Um, we are fast approaching the day that all kids dream about. They count it down. That's right. So let me let me bring you up to state championships. Uh, exciting thing happened this year. They split them into two different fields, um, a 5A and a 4A. And that was in an effort to try to give some of the smaller schools a, an opportunity to participate. But exciting news out of Douglas County. Of the, uh, it looks like 16 schools that made the uh, tournament in the 5A, five of them were Douglas County schools. So we're talking Rock Canyon, Chaparral, Highlands Ranch, Mountain Vista, and Castleview. Unfortunately, no one made it out of the first round, but having five teams in the top 16 is pretty awesome. That's very competitive. In the 4A ranks, Boys State Lacrosse, we had Ponderosa make that battle. Um, they were one, uh, they're actually the only 4A school in our district, and they made it to the second round of the quarterfinals. They had an opening round win, uh, looked pretty convincing, and then they lost to Air Academy, who is now, I believe Air Academy is in the top four. You know, Ponderosa's got a lot of things to celebrate this year. Certainly wrestlers, the lacrosse. I, 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 I'm sure I'm leaving somebody out, and I'm, we'll, well hear about I remember it, and I'll put we, them on next Well, I remember when we started talking about winter sports, if you'll remember, Ponderosa cleaned up. And yeah. the same with fall sports. I remember football, they had a, yeah. a team that went ahead, the cross-country team. I think they had the individual 4A state champion in cross-country. So, we could do a whole show on Ponderosa. Yeah, and Tim Ottman. Yeah. Tim Ottman, my, one of my favorite athletic directors. So uh, girls state lacrosse championships. There's actually two teams in Douglas County, three teams in Douglas County, Thunder Ridge, Chaparral, and Castleview. Two of those made it to the tournament, um, and one of them's still playing. They're actually going to play tonight down at Air Academy High School. That's Chaparral High School. A very solid team. Good so for them. They're doing a great job. Uh, Thunder Ridge made it to the second round. Congratulations to them. Congratulations to the girls at Douglas County High School, Castleview. They're a combined team. In the 5A Double Elimination State Baseball Tournament, um, one side of the bracket is all Douglas County schools. <laughs> and that's so, just the luck of the draw, right? That's, I, I think that's the luck of the draw. The good news is at least one of our schools will be making it to the finals, it looks like. <laughs> but the bad news is, is they have to play each other before we get there. And there's some really good baseball teams in our district. Uh, the four teams on this list are Legend, Thunder Ridge, Chaparral, and Mountain Vista. Double elimination tournament. So you play, the winner stays in the upper bracket, the loser goes down to the lower bracket, but they have an opportunity to play back in. Mm -hmm. So you have to lose twice to be out. So it's really exciting action. That opens up on Saturday with a legend at Thunder Ridge and Chaparral at Mountain Vista. And the, the funny thing about that is that, you know, they're all in the same um, little bracket there, but because it's double, double elimination, they could end up losing their first game and then coming back and meeting the same team in the finals. Potentially, they could. And, and really, there could be um, – it, it could be really exciting. I mean, we have the number two team, the number three team, the number six team, and the number seven team. And I'll guarantee you those games were probably very tough battles oh, yeah. when they played each this other. This is baseball. I mean, I, I, these guys, anybody can win. So, In a girls' state soccer championships in the 5A level, we have the number one seed, Mountain Vista. We have the number three seed, Rock Canyon. Uh, Thunder Ridge, Castleview, Chaparral, and Highlands Ranch rounded out the field for the 5A. And it's the same kind of breakdown as the 5A, 4A, and uh, lacrosse. Um, Mountain Vista all the way to the quarterfinals. Rock Canyon is in the quarterfinals. Still playing. They're playing a doubleheader tonight. In fact, they're playing as we are or they warming up as we're talking over at Shea Stadium. Uh, double, a doubleheader with Rock Canyon playing Liberty, then Mountain Vista playing Fort Collins. Mountain Vista has to be the favorite. I think they have a girl that's on the national team. Very tremendous, uh, tremendous soccer program over at Mountain Vista. Yeah, and you know the high school soccer is a fun sport to watch. You get out, you maybe catch a Rapids game or something mm -hmm. like that. Catch, you know, if you get the channel on television at home that shows you the nine o'clock Manchester games. But the the soccer at the high school level is so much fun to watch. That ball moves so quick. 
very competitive, extremely competitive. So we're, we're going to end up probably having, um, I would say, two of the, the quarter or two of the semifinalists, yeah. looks like. And in girls' state soccer 4A, Ponderosa again made that field. So, again, kudos to Ponderosa for their work this year in athletics. There's other state championships coming up this week. We have uh, boys and girls track and fields going to happen this uh, weekend, I believe. Um, there is a ton of great sprinters in Douglas County, distance runners, field events. Um, if you have an opportunity to go watch that, it, it is ab- it's, it's really great. It's like a circus, I think. <laughs> you just put a tent on it because there's always something going on. There's a race on the track. There's a kid pole vaulting, somebody throwing the shot and disc. It's really exciting stuff. I think all that's up at the Jeffco Stadium is what I remember. I'll turn it over to you because I think you have some kudos to some of our schools. Yeah, well, you know, we're Ed Nation, everything that's um, talked about throughout the nation, and we bring it back down to Douglas County. This is the time of the year where all these things are wrapping up, and not just the um, athletic pieces. Um, A lot of these are very exciting. These are the final sports for some students, especially those graduates, but... With those graduates come those post-secondary opportunities. And um, one of the things that our district does is um, we, we want to continue supporting our students um, as they grow and as they go. And um, we have what we call the Administrator Scholarship. Um, this is money that's actually um, uh, raised here within the administrative ranks and um, within our schools. Uh, this is an opportunity... You know, you've got principals that if you're a high school principal, you, you've got nine to five and you've got 400 additional hours with all those sports you're talking about and attendance because they show up. They're part of the school. This is part of their culture. It's a long day. And yet they still give back in other ways. And um, sometimes it's financially. They participated in a couple of outings, um, donated some money, and that money has gone to scholarships. I'm going to read these names, but... Um, 12 outstanding Douglas County School District seniors have been named recipients of this year's administrator scholarships. Many of these students are selected from among the top performers at their school, and several of them have overcome great obstacles in their respective schools. We got to hear um, the principals of these schools who announced their winners, told them their backstory. I mean, uh, I don't care who you are. Sometimes you're just brought to tears, um, by some of the things that these students have overcome and still still have accomplished great academic things and athletic things in school. Yeah, and, and there are some tremendous stories in there. The one uh, regarding the Thunder Ridge student losing their parent and moving to Thunder Ridge as a sophomore and, and the really embracing of the Thunder Ridge feeder area with that student um, to move them towards graduation was absolutely phenomenal story. And every single one of these is a great story. Um, and I, I think that's one of the that's one of my favorite meetings. Is, yeah, it, is because mine too. Because you can see the the work that goes on behind the scenes to support kids from not only the principal level but staff level, counseling level, community support. I mean, it's a it's a huge endeavor um, to wrap your arms around a student that's struggling and make sure that they get an opportunity. The other thing I wanted to say about that is is the money is all generated by our administrators. So the golf tournament mm-hmm. that's one way in which you can give to this. Um, we have a sub for the day program. I can't remember the specific name of it, but the notion is this, is I as a building administrator, if one of my teachers need a sub, I can go take over their classroom for the day and the money it would have cost to have a sub, that money goes into this pool to to grant these scholarships. Um, We also work very closely with the Educational Foundation and they have contributed dollars to this as well. Um, This grew from, I think, five or six years ago. Obviously, there was one per building to the 12 that we now have. And we we try to keep it at 12, but that's a really tough decision, too, for those administrators to sit down and talk about stories. Well, let me read you one of the recipients. This is a quote from one of the recipients. It was really exciting for me because my family is not particularly well off because of the economy. So one of my biggest concerns was for paying for college. She's going. She needs to pay for it. This is something that's going to help towards that. So I'll, I'll go through it. I'll name the, the kiddos because I want to recognize these guys. Congratulations. A scholarship is, um, is certainly going to uh, help them along the way, and we want to continue supporting. Devin Cole, Legend High School. Molly Dean, Castleview High School. Anna Elfring, Castleview High School. Kenzie Kaplan-Lopez, Chaparral. Laura Londano, Mountain Vista High School. Miranda McHodgkins, Legend High School. Rob Monroe. Rock Canyon. Caitlin Pfeiffer, or is it Pfeiffer? I think it's Pfeiffer. Yeah. Um, she's from Douglas County. 
Michaela Roddenbaugh from Ponderosa, Daryl Shaver from Thunder Ridge, Rebecca Smith, Mountain Vista, and Rebecca Wong, Highlands Ranch. We, you know, it, what I like about it, and I think we're going to be going to the break in a minute, um, what I really like about it is no matter who you are, you are reminded that this is why we are here that this is what we do. We always talk about our core business and we honor a lot of different people for the jobs they do. We certainly make shout outs to teachers every week. Um, these, the, the kids, these kids moving on, these kids having some sort of completion, graduating and supporting them for the next thing in their life. I, I really think this is one of the, the tear jerker, you know, pieces that we have to always remember, always rekindle and always celebrate. In the many tearjerker moments we're going to have over the next two <laughs> weeks, because we all know there's going to be multiple things that happen at graduations. Hey, when we come back, we're going to continue celebrating the great things going on in Douglas County and take a little bit broader view. But you're listening to Education Nation on Castle Rock Radio. Welcome back to Castle Rock Radio. You're here with Dan and Chris, and we are celebrating all that is good in the Douglas County world today. We just spent 15 straight minutes talking about uh, achievements of our students this year, and we're wrapping up the school year, so we're going to try to get a few more in. And we're not um, done. We are not done. But wait, there's more. But wait, act now. But wait, there's more. Two Coloradoans named Presidential Scholars. Amy Chin of Highlands Ranch High School was among 141 high school seniors selected from among 3,300 eligible students. They looked at academic work, essays, school evaluations, community service, other factors. Imagine that. Two Coloradoans, one of them lives in our community, Amy Chin from Highlands Ranch High School, a Presidential Scholar. What a huge, huge, huge thing that was for her Ouch. to win that. I mean, think about that. 141 total kids selected across the entire United States of all high school kids. We have one of them in one of our schools. Yeah. Fabulous. And one of only two in Colorado. Yeah. The other one lives in Centennial, too. Goes to uh, another school district school right across county line. So, But Amy Chin, congratulations. You know, Chris, earlier this week I had an opportunity to go up to Thunder Ridge High School, and we've talked before about the uh, Pro Start program that they have, the Culinary Arts program. Um, there was a really cool competition that went on there. I know you watch the, cook the cooking shows, don't you? I, 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 if Top I don't chef, get to watch it, I DVR things. it. Yeah, well, well up at uh, Thunder Ridge High School, there's a couple things that happened. First of all, on March 1st, there was an event at Denver's Johnson Wales University, and the uh, program at Douglas County or at, at uh, Thunder Ridge High School actually won that program up there. There was a student um, named Nick Safina, I believe, that was the top chef up there. Well, guess what? On Monday afternoon, this guy had an opportunity to be in a cooking competition, very similar to those shows, where they have the MC come in and they say, ready, you have 15 minutes to get all your stuff ready to go, ready, go, start chopping. They chopped up all yeah, the it's ingredients. A, it's like a reality TV show for exactly. cooks. They, they throw them in a room, they give them a bunch of ingredients, and they give them a time limit, right? Yeah, and the uh, the ingredients the kids actually had to think about. Um, what, what it was was beforehand they told them, we want you to... Uh, devise a dish that um, talks about the American experience to you. What does it mean to be uh, in culinary programming in uh, America? And so each student had an opportunity to go through and think about that, and then they prepared something. Um, they had one of the girls prepared buffalo. Um, there was a, a pork roast that one prepared, and then our, our guy, our boy, prepared steak. And it was really fascinating watching this student compete. I mean, he was so calm and cool under pressure, sitting there chopping up all of his stuff and, and cooking it all. They had about 40 minutes to cook it. And then they took it into another room, and they actually did the tasting and critiqued their food. Um, and then one of the students won a knife set. <laughs> which <laughs> she's actually from a Jefferson County school. So they're going to ship the knife set to that school. So And they can deal um, with that. That's right. That's <laughs> right. But it was really awesome. And, and what a feather in the cap of our Pro Start program. It's only been there three years. Well, and congratulations to Nick. I mean, making it this far. And so 
Where the camera crews, they film this. Is this going to be televised? Is this? Oh, yeah. Was on it, the was Food it, Channel. Did you say Chopped? On the Food Channel. Chopped is the program that it's a takeoff from, I believe. And this was an internationally recognized person. Uh, Flavors of My World, a culinary tour through 25 countries. The actual host of that show is one of the cooks on that show. Her name is – I'm going to destroy this name because I, I can't say it. Her last name's Shahan, and she is actually the cook on that show. And she came, and they had the um, the person who's been recognized as the Colorado Cook of the Year or Colorado uh, Chef of the Year. All right. He was one of the judges up there too. So but this is the culinary equivalent of making ESPN's Top Ten. That's right. And it looks like the show is going to air on Monday, May 13th. And the student's name is Nick Sedina, and he represented Thunder Ridge High School Pro Start teacher Katie Waskey. So congratulations to yeah, them. We'll have to absolutely. make sure that we give them some more props because actually that show's already happened, hasn't it? That well, was when they taped the show, May 13th, but it's coming up on the uh, the Food Channel. Well, yeah, we'll have to figure that out. That's Congratulations. I mean, I, I really do think that the district does a great job with these um, career tech ed pieces, the components where kids can do a pathway, and, and the culinary arts. I mean, how many times have we talked about it on this show? From J- Seth Jason to doing at elementary, the – the salsa gardens and then using mm-hmm. that for fundraising, turning around, having the kids actually do it. I mean, there is a lot of thoughts. Um, kudos to our nutrition services. Kudos to Nick. Kudos to, is it Kathy? Katie. Katie. Katie Waski. Katie Waski. I mean, just all around great stuff. All right, let's talk about some cool schools. Um, Copper Mesa and Flagstone Elementary School in Douglas County were awarded green flags Thursday from the National Wildlife Federation. Got to go to both these ceremonies. Mm -hmm. Um, Very amazing. Um, What has happened over the years is, you know, you think green, you think energy efficiency, you think recycling. Well, they've taken it to another level. In fact, they've taken it to such a level that they are the first two schools in Colorado to be recognized and only the um, 15th and 16th or the 14th and 15th in the nation so far to be recognized. Um, To earn a green flag, they have to have conservation initiatives, recycling, reducing emissions, energy, water use, that all goes into it. More than 7,000 students are running sustainability projects in their school, in the district, says our lead guy, Lee Smith. Our lead, yeah, Lee Smith. Lee Smith. Smith. I put an H on there for (laughs) some reason. I think it was just a pattern. Um, let me give you some facts. Colorado, or Copper Mesa, which was elementary in Highlands Ranch, one of the schools, saved 127,511 kilowatt hours of electricity. Hmm. That's you, a lot of You don't turn know what that means, lights. do you? That means a lot. <laughs> At Flagstone in Castle Rock, another school, Flagstone Elementary, students and staff reduced the amount of waste left from the lunches by having a program in there to eat what you get. So um, that goes on and on. You can find out more information, but congratulations. You know, another Douglas County first ever. Then we have two, 15th and 16th mm-hmm. in the nation as a total. I mean, um, congratulations to Lee, who's worked with these students. Congratulations to these schools who have helped work with these students to keep it going. And congratulations to the students themselves who've actually done the work to get there. Well, and I think the thing that's really powerful about this, Chris, is that each school personalizes this to their building. So it's not like everybody has to do the same things. They look within their building, and and usually, especially at the high school level, and I know probably at the elementary school, they have a team of students that actually decide, here's what we want to invest our time in. So it's different from school to school to school. Now, they probably take ideas from other schools. Um, but I remember when this first started years back, the the discussions that kids had then, it's like we're light years away from those discussions. They're finding new and innovative ways of, of making a difference. And I think last week at the board meeting, I don't remember what that <laughs> big number was, but that was a big number, as I remember. Well, and just uh, you know, to talk about what other schools are doing, we did have a school who came, and during public comments, we had, I think, six or seven elementary students do a, like a mini three-minute presentation right. during public a comment on a mission of school buses Mm -hmm. and that they had actually collected data on it. They were talking, they timed how long the buses were running between drop-off and Mm pickup, and and they calculated from some resource how much emissions the typical diesel school bus gives off during a minute when parked. (laughs) I mean, and then they presented all this. So, I mean, this is becoming more than just a socially conscious thing. This is becoming a way for our young students. It is. It's really cool. Saves a lot of money, and it kids great learning experience. So, 
a couple weeks ago had an article in the paper about Douglas County missing the best high schools list. There was a 2000, 2012, um, excuse me, 2012 U.S. News and World Report best high schools list. It was released on April 29th. And how many of these lists are there? Well, that's what we're going to get to here because <laughs> there's a lot of them. The, the point is here that, that this list, there was several of our high schools on last year. In 2011, Highlands Ranch, Rock Canyon, Mountain Vista were among the top 1,000 among almost 5,000 top performing schools. Didn't get in this time and really uh, dug into that. Our principals did because, it, you know, it's a competition thing, obviously. And so those principals see that and they go, well, wait a second. And so they look at the criteria and they can make a determination very quickly about why they got in or why they didn't get in. So the short story is on this one is they changed the criteria. Sure. So you had to meet a minimum threshold of uh, – of students in a certain area in order to even be into the competition. And, and once you're there, then they take into account AP r- scores. Exactly. And when you talk about criteria, you're talking about a range of things from the socioeconomic breakdowns to the demographics of the school to how many perhaps second language student people you have. Uh, I mean, there are um, there's criteria that, that works um, um, to different schools' favor. And I, I think the takeaway, because we've seen some of these lists, we have we have great high schools in the district. I think everybody knows that. Certainly if you're an attendant, if you're a parent, you know it because you get to live it all mm-hmm. the time. Um, but I don't think you can make too much out of not being included one year from the next when they do filter the, um, the criteria um, every year. I think how many people turn over? I mean, half the people are new to this list every year, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, I think it said over a third of them third. were. Um, I think it was a third is what I remember reading from here. You know, we're, we love to oh, be recognized. We were, we were about half and half there. 40% of the schools in last year's list didn't make the 2000, 2013 list. So, And it's not because they changed. I mean, it's simply because the criteria But was... my pet peeve is they should have to declare how they changed the criteria so that yeah. people would understand that. And so we could stop answering all the phone calls we got on why we're not on the list this but year. But the good news is is a week later there was yet another <laughs> list so i lobbed the softball you hit it out of the park 40 colorado schools make newsweek's list of the top 2000 public high schools so newsweek has their 2000 list of the 40 schools in colorado guess how many from douglas county made that list um more than half uh that's correct six out of our nine comprehensive high schools made this two thirds including rock canyon high school Thunder Ridge High School, Douglas County High School, Chaparral, Ponderosa, and Highlands Ranch. Now, somebody would immediately go to, well, what about the three that didn't make it? Of course. This is a self-disclosed list. So you (laughs) have, in order to be in the competition, you have to submit your data. And so, for whatever reason, the data didn't happen. So, if you caught the application, it came by your, and you you put in the time to do it, then you were considered. Correct. If you missed it for some reason, you weren't. Yeah. And so, I mean, because we can take a look at some of our schools that aren't on this list and line them up against the data that's on here, and they would easily make it into the top forty. Yeah. And so, another list. I'll reiterate. I mean, if you're on the list, congratulations. You did earn it. You should be recognized. You are a great school. Um, if you're not, we recognize that you're great schools too. It's just, you know, maybe we should start sharing out. But you said you said competitive. Maybe we should start sharing out these links to apply. Well, for I, these things. I think that the challenge is, is our our principals get such a huge volume of things that um, very makes it very difficult. So are we ready to go to break here? I'm here in music. Are we ready? All right. You're listening to Ed Nation on Castle Rock Radio with Dan and Chris. Welcome back to Castle Rock Radio. This is Dan and Chris, and this is Ed Nation. Ed Nation. Yeah, Chris. Uh, The other thing that's been happening in the past few weeks is our principals have been spending a ton of time doing evaluations. It is that time of the year. I mean, there's closure on a lot of things, and um, teachers get in their summative. You know, everybody gets evaluated at this time of the year. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about some things that are happening around us, and then maybe we can step back in around what's going on in Douglas County. But um, one of the big things that, that could influence us is House Bill 13-1257, where it tweaks the uh, state's 2010 Educator Evaluation Law, Senate Bill 191, and gives the Department of Education greater oversight of district principal and teacher evaluation plans. Um, current, 
law allows districts to use a state model system or develop their own system. And we've talked about this before. We chose to develop our own system. How do you think this will impact us um, that now it seems like the Department of Education has been given even greater oversight of district principal and teacher evaluation plans? Well, even before this was put in place, we had been we had been working for four years to develop a new teacher evaluation. And in fact, uh, CDE, Colorado Department of Education, had actually seen a lot of the work. And the committee that was building it was trying to parallel it against the work that um, CDE had been doing. Um, that was actually one of the issues, just trying to keep it uh, less convoluted because you know, if someone changes it and you go back and you try to change yours mm -hmm. and instead of rewriting it, you tweak it and you have a whole bunch of tweaks that no longer means anything anymore. So um, when we were done, we, even before this was um, put into place, we, we actually had CD take a look at it and they gave us the thumbs up. So the teacher one's good to go. I think as we look at other areas, um, certainly like the principal evaluation, which this is addresses, um, we will simply crosswalk it with um, their document and show them how it aligns and how we cover what they want and also how it's um, rigorous and stands up to what we know is important in 21st century leadership and and get their thumbs up and move forward. I, um, I, I believe in local control. I do think that districts do need to take these things on for themselves. They do need to be able to customize their evaluations so that they reach the targets of their districts. We have a range of districts in Colorado. Rural districts have different challenges than urban or suburban. Um, I, I really think that those have to be evident in the look for us. How do you hold people accountable to achieve those goals if not through the evaluation? They have to be able to, to create a document that clearly articulates their priorities while, and I understand this, maintaining a sense of um, assessment or evaluation for a lot of overall pieces. For example, um, yeah, you have to have, um, you have, to have you know, building culture in it. You have to have professionalism. Mm -hmm. You have to have the compulsory ones that are like, um, I will behave ethically and follow state laws. You know, those things have to be in there. And I recognize they have to be in there for everything. And for oversight, I think CD probably needs to maintain that. But when you talk about delivery and instruction and a focus on lesson planning, those need to be um, determined at the district level. Now, if you don't want to do it, CD has got a, uh, an evaluation. You can pull it out and you can use that. And I would invite anybody to go look at that tool. And, and, you know, especially I know when I've stood in front of teachers in our district and have said, let's look at the first standard <laughs> in the CDE um, teacher evaluation. Under, it's under CDE under educator effectiveness. You can go right. in there and look at the rubric. And, you know, I, I know a lot of well-meaning people spend a lot of time trying to develop that. But I think the bottom line is, is you know, when we looked at that, we felt like this is too much. This well, is too big and too vague and too whatever – Whatever you want to say about it. And I think, I, I think that's the piece we got into there. And I, we've talked about this, but I'll try to be quick with it. You have 40 different people in a room building, you know, experts in a room. But they're from 40 different districts with 40 different right. strategic plans. And so they come from a mentality of their own st strategic plan. They are putting in, they're prioritizing what's important in their district. You do that with 40 different people, you get this document. You get the kitchen sink. And uh, good as it may be, it's really hard to have a growth model and develop um, teachers when you have a list of a thousand things. If everything becomes important, nothing ends up being important. And, and that's sort of the trap. And I think if you were to take that document and highlight the, you know, the dozen things in there that's important for your district and you start working from there, you'd get your document and then you add your strategic plan initiatives. Let's, let's move it over. I'll tell you, um, there are states that have gone through this. We have Senate Bill 191, which changed it. We're gonna, I'm going to link back to this after because you've got some data. We have half of the evaluation is practice. You know, it's the practitioner piece. The other and that's half, what we evaluated teachers on this year was just the that. practitioner piece. Just Standards that. one through five of the really? site evaluation. Well, there's this whole other piece of assessment. You know, student performance is attached right. to this. We Standard have, six. We haven't gone down this road yet. Every district in Colorado has to go down this road next year. And, and we're, we're preparing for it. We've actually been preparing for it all year. But there are some states that are ahead of us. You know, Kentucky was ahead of us when they were talking about doing the Common Core first, and they tested it this year. Mm -hmm. Didn't go well. <laughs> well, Florida was ahead of us in terms of the Standard 6 assessment. 
<laughs> now, this isn't evidence of national um, across the board stuff, but I think it's worth talking about because it brings up a few things that we need to be mindful, not only as a nation, but as Colorado and as Douglas County. The um, NEA, the National Education Association, on behalf of Florida chapters, teachers, um, filed suit against the Florida Department of Education. They're actually taking the Florida Department of Education to court. They're contending that some teachers are being judged against students or subjects that they don't teach in violation of the constitutional rights. So let's play this out a little bit because mm -hmm. this is, I mean, let's talk about the assessment system. We recognize that the state requires one assessment. Everybody's got to do it, right? TCAP. TCAP. And well, they require ACT, but only for 11th graders. Right. So we would say that that's one measure, right? We wouldn't base our whole lives on moving forward off of that one measure. But that's what Florida did. That's what Florida did. Right. So the <clears throat> problem is they don't, not every kid, like if you're in kindergarten, first or second, you don't take TCAP Correct. or PARC or ACTs. Or if you're in a business class or an art class or a P class or a music class or a band class, I mean, the list goes on. So the argument from an art teacher, you know, or a second grade teacher is, well, what what data are you going to, you know, create my assessment from? So as we move forward, we recognize this early on. As soon as Senate Bill 191 was passed, we realized, wait a sec, we're going to need a body of evidence. Well, maybe that's because you and I both taught things that would be outside of the traditional <laughs> testing piece. Right. I, mean, I started in kindergarten. And I started in PE. So, I, I mean, we had, we had measures there, but they wouldn't be considered in Florida as, as part of this. So, so there's probably some standing, and they're going to tweak it, obviously, we want to make sure ours is, you know, and, and what's amazing is every school district in Colorado is going to be doing this exact same thing next year. Mm -hmm. We're all making this up. But what's really interesting, I think, as well, is that other districts haven't even started this conversation yet. Yeah. Um, or, or if they are, they're in very early stages, just like the evaluation piece. You have to have an evaluation tool in place in August when you start for this next year. Right. How many districts did we hear from our colleagues going, well, we really haven't done anything with yeah, that Yeah, we're going to do it next year. Yeah. That's what they said. Well, guess what? You don't get an opportunity to test drive it and refine it. I, I think we're in a really strong position to make this even better right. going into next year now that we've driven it once. What a lost opportunity not to be ahead of this. I mean, you, you have to assume some people really did think it was going to go away or be delayed. So let's go back to the Florida piece because they're, they're talking about their statewide testing is the sole measure that they're using to evaluate all these teachers, correct? Right. The state-approved formula for measuring student growth on state standardized tests is being stretched far beyond the limit of its purpose. Well, I actually agree with that. Yeah. I totally agree with that. And in fact, let's talk a little bit about what, what's different about that than what we're doing or exactly. what the state of Colorado is doing. So in the state of Colorado, as I understand it, um, 50% of a teacher's evaluation is going to be based on standard six. That's the growth Student in achievement performance. students. Yep. Okay. So of that 50%, only 10% of that 50% can be TCAP. A, a very, a very small amount. Okay. So we're talking 10% of the 50% or 5%. You can slice it however you want. It, it, yeah. It turns out to be so, 5%. So the other percentage Okay, the other 90% of that 50% can be based on local measures. Right. And so talk a little bit about what Dr. Morgan's been doing this year with teachers well, around defining and working through those local measures piece. It's, it's, it's exactly what you said. She um, enlisted volunteers to pilot a lot of this stuff so that we could be moving forward. She is teams, uh, uh, hundreds of teachers building interim assessments so that we'll have them if, if teachers want to use them as part of the body of evidence. And she's working within the district to create, create parameters by which schools will define their body of evidence. So let's say I'm a, I'm a sixth grade teacher. I already have pretests that I've used for years, right? They could probably be part of it. I probably already do have formative tasks, formative performance assessments, formative rubrics. Again, those are things that I've created. Those are things that I've accumulated or I've brought in that I've made my own. These are things that through a, a process of vetting could be part of that body of evidence. Then I probably will have a component in there that's not just my individual stuff, but the collaboration piece. Everybody says, oh, you're pitting teachers against them. Mm -hmm. Not true. We are in this together. And the fact that in standard six, a portion of it is going to be collaborative data. Think about how invested I would be now as a sixth grade teacher, as soon as I have a sixth grade opening, that I want to be on that interview team. I want to make sure we're mm -hmm. bringing the best person in here because they're 
performance is going to make my performance better and it's all going to be connected so it really does bring that collaborative piece so that i mean you add all these bodies of evidence these all these pieces you put them in there and that state piece is just so small that and i think as as we learn lessons from florida and florida is not going to be the only one here but as we learn lessons from florida on those people who put so much emphasis on it we're going to have to be very careful to um, and we're probably going to have to argue, you know, whether it's with the states or the rules and guidelines or the law, that it's just not fair as a kindergarten teacher that you are throwing TCAP at me. Well, I really like that the state has allowed us more local control. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's really what this is, and I think what we've done with this is given that power to teachers. <clears throat> and having an opportunity to listen to teachers about what they think is important in defining growth and achievement in their classroom, I think that's a really powerful place for them to be. And and we have fabulous teachers in Douglas County that have absolutely been doing this. I mean, you told the story about the music teacher that you visited with um, that you had no idea. How would you measure a kid's growth and performance in music? Yeah, and he, he basically um, explained to me that there is a program, a computer program that he connects to a drum pad and it tests rhythm and timing and it can take interim assessments and it can measure students' growth in terms of um, improvement over time. Mm -hmm. it, I was blo you know, because I've never taught music and it's been a long time since I had to evaluate a music teacher. I didn't even know these things had come into existence, yet he's talking to me like, oh, yeah, we've had it for years. Yeah, and I think the exciting thing is that he's a direct um, proponent of that, and he gets the opportunity to control his own destiny in his well, classroom. And not only that, he was part of the team that wrote the evaluation for music teachers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really exciting news, and I'm glad we're not in Florida <laughs> because I think we'd both be pulling our hair out with we talked about with this teacher evaluation bill, and then we got this with Florida. I mean, what's next? I mean, this is, this is almost like Big Brother coming in and saying, thou shalt do X, Y, and Z, and, and you just get to become a manager. You don't get to create or implement or do any of the things that make being an administrator fun. Yeah, and you know, I think I think this is a great segue to bring it down to you know, not just what we're doing because we have a lot of things to celebrate, but what's going on around us nationally in terms of teacher pay, and then Colorado, and then moving on to what we're the the great things that we're throwing out there for teachers. Next Love year. that. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be back. You're listening to Castle Rock Radio and Ed Nation with Dan and Chris. Stand on the street. I thought you tried. Welcome back to Castle Rock Radio. Uh, this is Dan and Chris on Ed Nation. Chris, I wanted to bring it a little bit closer to home. One of the other big things that happened this week is we had a special Board of Education meeting last evening, and we're going to talk about that a little bit in the future. Uh, but I wanted to talk about some districts around us that have had some pretty significant challenges as well, just to kind of put this in context. This was an article that was in uh, on May 7th in the Tri-Lakes News. That is directly south of us, Lewis Palmer. And the title of this is More Students, Fewer Teachers. <laughs> Hello, McFly. <laughs> it was the wrong way. Yeah, exactly. And, and it goes in there to kind of detail about what's going on down at Lewis Palmer. Uh, the student population has nearly doubled in recent years. That, that sounds um, Well, it's good. They can use that high school here. they built that's set empty for a year. But at the same time, the number of teachers and administrators has significantly dropped. In here, So they interviewed the superintendent, and he says it's been quite a challenge. You know, in the last few years, we've had to make as many as $11 million in cuts, which when you're looking at Oof. a small district, that's a huge amount of money. Yeah, you as know, a percentage of their overall budget, it's probably close to 10 or 11%. But there was a couple things that I thought were significant based on what we've been talking about this year. Um, he's worried more about the number of teachers because it forces larger class sizes. Well, yeah. Of course it does. Well, really, and, you know, we've, we kind of lived through this. I mean, over the last few years, our class sizes went up just because of budget restrictions. And boy, did the parents come out of the woodwork to tell us they didn't like that. Yep. 30 fewer teachers for more than 450 extra students. This was really interesting because I had not heard this. He said a few years ago the high school teachers went to teaching six classes instead of five, increasing the number of students in their classes. The district had to effectively cut 20% of the teachers at the high school level. So what they did is they mm. raised the number of classes the teachers had to teach, then they cut keeping the class size the same, 
we had an opportunity this year to raise the number of classes that teachers took, but we left that savings in the building um, once we had to obviously pay the bills. But yeah, we, we, left, didn't, we didn't reduce teaching. We left a portion of that teaching right. savings in the building. We did have to reduce teaching. There's no question but we reduced attrition, teachers. We didn't, we didn't send a lot of people home with pink, sh- pink we've, slips. We've done the other stuff in years past with doing that because okay. we had to cut teaching staff. But what happened this last time mathematically was, let's say I have 100 teachers in my building. A portion of that that reduction was born on saying everybody's going to teach six, so maybe 20 of those 100 new sections I get, maybe that's what went toward paying off the deficit that we had. The other 80 I got to keep in my building as a building principal and provide additional sections. So it drove down class size. Right. What they did in Lewis Palmer is they said, we're going to add another class to every single teacher, and then we're going to take whatever that savings was to pay pay out. So class size stayed the same so, size So if you were a teacher bigger. there, if you were a teacher there, you could have had five classes of, say, 35 kids each. Now you have six classes of 35 each. That's correct. And you may lose your job. That's correct. <laughs> that's what happened there. I thought that was really interesting. So and we've done the opposite. I mean, over the last year, we went to six of eight. We lowered class sizes. We actually put more money back in schools this year, allowing mm-hmm. them to have the choice of adding more electives or adding more teachers, whatever they wanted to do. We've actually gone the other way. That's right. And, and I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it's been perfect all across the board. There has been some, some challenges because we have had teachers that have increased their workload. Obviously, all of them have by teaching an additional class. But looking at instructional time, looking at the average number of kids that were, were added to classes, um, that's not – as pure as what happened in Lewis and Palmer. All right. Uh, so All right. the other thing is up in Greeley in the past couple of weeks, they okayed a contract. Okay. And this is the situation so where – Greeley is another <clears throat> district north of Denver. That's correct. Uh, Education Association made many compromises but ultimately came out of this year's negotiation with a new master agreement. Among other things, increases a teacher's workday by 30 minutes. So, so. they went from – uh, eight hour day to an eight and a half hour day. In our district, it's seven and a half hours. So they're they're now teaching an hour more a day than our teachers. That's correct. Planning time for teachers was standardized at all grade levels. Standardized. What does that mean, Chris? I'd love to know what that means. I would too. And in fact, we probably should call up there. But I can't imagine them saying we're going to give elementary teachers more prep time. To match the high school teachers who get prep time based on their block scheduling, right? I believe most of the schools in Greeley are block schedule schools. Right. So if I'm a high school teacher that has 90 minutes of prep, do you think the elementary teachers got 90 minutes of prep, or do you think they well, went the it, other way? I don't know. If it's standardized, I would assume it's equal. <laughs> I, I would bet that they probably went the other way, where they reduced prep time at the secondary level. Um, these two actions will result in an average 5.88% for employees across the district. So they are going to give a raise, 5.88%. Is their ac- package. Across the whole district. So every teacher, regardless of who they are. How long they've been there. Gets 5.88. Everybody gets 5.88. There you go. All right. So here's another story out of uh, New York Times, May 6th. Teacher pay hurt by recession, report says. Is that a shocking Yeah, that could headline? probably have gone into <laughs> our, uh, you know, come on, man, file. That's right. During the recession, its aftermath, public schools took a hit as both state coffers and local property taxes shriveled. They showed up in shrinking improvement, but also in teacher salaries. The vast majority of teachers took a pay cut or saw their pay frozen for at least one year between 2008 and 2012. Yeah. What happened here? Four, five years of pay freezes? Four straight years of pay freezes for teachers, five years of administrator pay freezes. Despite the downturn, some districts managed to give teachers <laughs> large pay increases. Chicago. Um, yeah, but they had to close schools. To Milwaukee, New York, Baltimore, Jefferson County in Kentucky, and Fresno, California. In Chicago, teachers received contractually negotiated raises of 4% in 9, 10, and 11, as well as increases for extra years of experience. And you said it. What happened in Chicago besides this? Well, they had to close the schools to pay for the raises. <clears throat> yeah, Interesting. All right. Priorities. You're, the anticipation's killing me. We've got to get to what we're doing here. Okay, so let's get there. Last evening, exciting news coming from our Board of Education. We approved pay raises for our staff. Um, we've been talking about the site evaluation, and all along our goal was to pay our best teachers more as identified by site. And it, it really took into consideration the stuff you just talked about, pay freezes. If you want to take one teacher hired five years ago, 
right? And they've been working five years at that same entry level, which was like $35,000 a year. They've been making it every year. They've been frozen. They didn't get anywhere. They got their first raise last year, but they're a six-year teacher now. I mean, they've right. been in this industry for a long time. Other six-year teachers are making well over their, their salary. So how do you adjust that? So there was a couple other things. I'll answer your question in a minute. But the, the couple other things that have happened is during that same time frame, I could move to another district and I may get six years of experience or someone coming into our district may get years of experience. So a teacher five years ago that started, let's say $40,000 here. So how do you get a raise in, 40, a, in they've a recession? Been frozen. You jump districts. That's exactly right. And I don't think people understand that dynamic. We have people in our system that are being paid more that came here later than teachers that were in our system five years ago. Because we gave credit for years experience when they came to our district. So the other thing that has to happen, and this gets to your question, how do you make up for that, is a differentiated pay scale. Right. And so looking at above market, below market, at market is one of the criteria we're looking at. So the teacher that started five years ago that's making $40,000 after five years of teaching. Who should be making more and we want to keep and we want to honor they will obviously get a bigger pay raise if all other things are equal. To catch them up. That's correct, in an effort to try to get them to that market value. So that's the notion that goes on behind this. Don't leave. Let us make it up to you. That's right, if you're highly effective. Well, I think the more effective you are, the more raise you That's get. That's correct. And, and we're very interested in paying our best teachers more. So here's the shocker. I've worked in five different districts. During break, you were talking about how many you've worked in. I've been in. in nine different school systems. Have you ever seen this size? No. This, this package is the biggest package I've ever seen. And so let's talk about the package, Chris. Well, I mean, I could be, <laughs> I, based on my evaluation, I could be kind of just kind of average, and I, I'm still getting 5.2%. Right. Now, that's inclusive of para increase, which is a 0.9%. Well, it's a package, yeah. And that's also inclusive of medical benefits, which we heard last evening a couple comments about medical benefits. In other industries, they don't pay for medical Listen, benefits. Everybody knows. Watch the news. Medical benefits are going up across the board in industry. The district's giving you the money for the increase. So the 0.9 and the 0.3, that's 1.2% of the total package that every single employee in our district no matter what your evaluation was beyond that we have people you know if I'm highly effective and I'm below market that teacher we just talked about I stand to make eight percent more plus the 1.2 the, that's correct so 9.2 percent so if I am that teacher who's been in the district suffered the salary freeze stayed with Douglas County and I'm effective I'm highly effective. I get 9.2% package raise. That's a staggering number. I, I have never, ever seen that. Me neither. Ever seen that. So anyway, thank you for joining us today. Exciting times in Douglas County. Please see if you can catch a graduation. There are 12 of them over the next two weeks, and we're excited to be here. I'm Dan. He's Chris. This is Ed Nation. You're listening to Castle Rock Radio.